Good afternoon and welcome to the lunchtime service from All Souls Church. My name is Alistair Gledsell. I help to lead these midweek meetings and you've joined us today partway through a series that we've called God in the Workplace. We're looking at some characters from the Bible to see how God has worked in them and through them for the good of others and for his own glory in the places that he has put them to serve him. And I'm hoping that we'll take away some challenge and some inspiration. Today we're in 2 Kings chapter 5 and looking at the story of a servant girl, a slave girl, who has an extraordinary impact on her master. And we're going to be helped in that by Mark Green, who will be speaking on that passage in just a moment's time. Uh, Mark is the executive director of LICC, the London Institute for Contemporary Christianity. It's an organization that had its birth in All Souls a few decades ago under the leadership of John Stott. LICC is dedicated to helping Christians to become whole life disciples. And they've done a great amount of work in connecting faith and work. Their website is a great place to visit for resources uh, on how to think through some of those things. Uh, and Mark has written extensively uh, on that topic too. Uh, he's written one book in particular that I want to recommend uh, here. Uh, it is Thank God It's Monday, uh, a sentiment not many of us might have uh, on a Monday morning, but a sentiment that many of us should. And his book is a great help in thinking through what it might look like for us to serve Christ and to speak for Christ in the places that we have been put uh, as we go to work day by day. Well, maybe that's something to look at uh, in the days ahead uh, to order online and have a read of. Uh, for now though, uh, we're about to have our Bible reading and uh, one of Mark's colleagues, Pippa, is going to be giving our Bible reading today before we do that, though, let me say a short word of prayer as we open God's word together. Let me pray. Our Heavenly Father, the psalmist writes, Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. And my prayer, our prayer now, is that you would open our eyes to see wonderful things in the scriptures as we hear them read and then preached from. Amen. The reading is from 2 Kings chapter 5, starting at verse 1. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master, and highly regarded, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Make the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go, Wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, 
I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpa, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophets had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. If you will not, said Naaman, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry. For your servants will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other god but the Lord. But may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Rimmon to bow down, and he is leaning on my arm, and I have to bow there also. When I bow down in the temple of Rimmon, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. Go in peace, Elisha said. The Lord be with you, right where you are. When uh, Alistair asked me to speak on this magnificent passage, it was a particular joy because the little girl in this passage has been a hero of mine for years. It's an extraordinary example, God working through an ordinary person and revealing his supremacy to two whole nations. The story comes in a section of Two Kings which focuses on Elisha, six chapters brimming with miraculous interventions. And though there is much to learn from Elisha's walk with God, today we're going to focus on the little girl and her relationship with God. So imagine this, your boss is not a Christian and your boss is ill with a fatal disease. So one day you knock on your door, or perhaps in these days you ask for five minutes at the end of a Zoom call on a personal matter. And you tell her that there is a man in Essex who can heal her. Now, imagine all the things that might prevent you taking such an action. Your perhaps indifference to your boss's predicament, your lack of courage to make such a bold offer, your belief that nothing good can come from Essex, the possibility that you don't believe that God can heal today, the possibility that you don't know anyone who has the particular gift of healing, your desire not to be seen to be meddling in someone else's prior private life, your desire not to be viewed as a fundamentalist redneck religious crank. Well, this young girl, this little girl, is probably no more than 13 years old. She's kidnapped, she's taken to a pagan land to work for the very commander of the very army that had taken her into captivity. She's wrenched from family and friends. She's isolated from people who believed in the one true God. She's in the wrong job, in the wrong country, with the wrong people. Now I wonder how do you suppose she might feel towards her God? And what are the temptations for us when life doesn't go quite as we would have wished, when we find ourselves in a context we'd rather not be in, when we're doing work we'd rather not be doing, when we're working for a boss or for an organisation where the values are completely contrary to our own, when we are isolated from our friends and our family, cut off from emotional and religious support. Well, isn't there sometimes a temptation to bitterness, to be angry against God? But this young girl is clear-headed. She doesn't let her circumstances determine her responses. God is still God. I expect this girl to be vengeful. Her mistress's husband is sick with leprosy. Now her response is not to see this as a, as a punishment from God for Naaman's, Naaman's idolatry. It serves him right. 
That's what happens when you mess with God's people. May his death be long and painful. After all, she has not read 2 Kings verse 5 verse 1, which says, through him, that is through name, the Lord had given victory to Aram. From her point of view, Naaman is the scourge of God's people. But still, her response is compassion. She loves her enemy long before the greatest king of Israel would say, you have heard it, you have heard it said, love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So just as Jesus calls on the people of Israel not to hate the Roman oppressors, so this girl is able to set aside national enmity for personal compassion. Perhaps too, this, this little girl, this young girl, understands God's wider intentions for Israel when he promised Abraham in Genesis 12 that through him all, all peoples on earth will be blessed. The people of God, that is we, we are to be channels of grace and blessing wherever we are, in lockdown and in out of it. So this young girl wants the best for her boss. She sees her boss from God's perspective. And I wonder if we do. I wonder sometimes whether we even pray for our bosses. I wonder if we encourage other people to pray for our bosses or if we ourselves pray for other people's bosses. Now, this, this young girl, this unnamed servant girl, does not let her lack of status as someone of a different race or her lack of status as a female in a patriarchal society or her lack of status as a slave or her lack of status as a youth. Doesn't let any of those things prevent her taking the initiative on behalf of the well-being of another person. Well, I wonder, aren't there lots of people who are hurting in different ways in your organisations? either because of work pressures or work relationships or the absence of work, or indeed because of things in their wider life. Or perhaps everyone you work with or connect to through work is doing just fine. Well, obviously issues do abound. And who will cry out to God for these people? Who will listen? Who will show kindness? Who will point them to God's wisdom, to Christ? Who among all God's people is connected to them. Of course, in a big company or a big organisation, you can't pray for everyone. But maybe God has put someone in particular on your heart or a few people on your heart. Or maybe you might want to ask God, who does he want you to pray for and reach out to in some way? Often I find that Christians think they are in the wrong place because they have no opportunity to do God's work there. But what is God's work? What is ministry? Well, it's loving people, blessing people. What is God's work? Well, it's creating goods and services and homes that help people flourish to his glory. It's stacking shelves so people can eat. It's cleaning streets so that diseases don't spread. It's auditing, auditing accounts so that justice is done and seen to be done. What is work that can be done for God? Anything that is done for God's glory in his strength and to the benefit of humankind. But back to our unnamed heroine. I wonder if you'd just been taken into captivity, might you not be tempted to believe that the God of Israel was actually less powerful than the God of Aram? After all, where are you? You are in Aram, not in Israel. You're in captivity, not free. Perhaps too, we are tempted to believe that God can make no real difference in the offices and factories and hotels and shops of our land, that he is a territorial God, that yes, on home ground, in sanctuaries and church halls and home groups or so on, our God is powerful enough to do great things. But when he's playing away, then he's impotent, impotent in the offices and factories and home working spaces of our land. No, he is still Lord of all. So this young girl, for this young girl on pagan land, there is a temptation to faithlessness. But despite her personal setbacks, she is full of faith. She knows who God is and what he's like. She believes that her God can heal.
can heal an enemy. And she knows where to send Naaman, unlike the king of Israel, who has no clue about where his enemy commander might be healed. And he tears his robes in panic, verse 7. This young girl knows. And you might expect her to be timid. After all, she's, she's 10, 12, 13, 14 years old, no more. She's a little girl. She's a servant girl. She's a foreigner. But no, she's not timid. She's bold. And what a risk she is taking. We're talking about leprosy here. We're talking about a killer disease. What if Naaman is not healed? What anger might ensue? What revenge? You sent me 150 miles on a wild goose chase to see a man who said nothing and did nothing and wouldn't even come down from his house to talk to me? Puff! I should have known it was just a spiteful little trick, an act of embittered revenge. Well, how did she know that Elisha might have such a gift? Well, maybe she'd heard the story of how God had used Elisha to raise the Shunammite son from the dead. Maybe. But either way, she knows that her God is sovereign over all, that her God can heal. Can our God heal? And I wonder, do we dare to ask? Now, it's interesting in Acts uh, chapter 4, verse 29, the disciples pray for the boldness to witness. Here's what it says. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Seven times in the book of Acts, we're told that the disciples, well trained by Jesus, three years with Jesus, nevertheless, they pray for boldness. Boldness in witness is not primarily a personality trait, as if extroverts are better at it than introverts. They aren't necessarily. Boldness to witness is a spiritual empowerment. But interestingly, the disciples not only pray for boldness, they also pray, verse 30, that God would stretch out his hands to do mighty works. Here's what it says. Stretch out your hand, Lord, to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. This is a key component for God getting his strategy out, his message out. And I wonder whether we dare to pray for both. Not only that God would give us the boldness to speak as he leads, but that God would intervene decisively in healing or in resolving some apparently intransigent problem. Well, I have to say that I've seen people who didn't know Jesus healed on the 10th floor of a Madison Avenue advertising agency in the middle of the day, and more than one. Did they become Christians? Well, not at that time, and not as far as I know since. But did he get their attention? Certainly got their attention. And I wonder whether in these socially distanced lockdown days, whether we might remember that we don't need to tell anyone to go see a prophet in Samaria or a healer in Essex or an ordained minister. God is not bound by time and space. In Matthew 8, for example, we see... Jesus just saying the word, and the centurion's servant is healed. And Jesus isn't even in the same room as him, not even the same house as him. Maybe, maybe one of the things that the Lord wants to teach us in these days is the power of remote prayer. Not just for those missionaries we pray for overseas, but for our colleagues that we can only these days see on Zoom. Well, coming back to the girl with no name, we might expect her to be somewhat demotivated in her work. But it seems that like Joseph in captivity, like Joseph under Potiphar, like Joseph in the prison, she's a good worker because there's something about her character that convinces Naaman's wife that it was worth suggesting to her husband that he take the extraordinary step of looking to an enemy for healing. You're an Aramean. You're the commander of an army. Go to Israel and find someone to heal you. It's just an outrageous idea. So this girl is somehow credible. Well, maybe Naaman's wife was simply desperate. Desperate people will resort to desperate measures. And seeking healing from an enemy who is a representative of a different God is a desperate measure. Maybe you've noticed that uh, when people in trouble they're often very much more open to pray. Even avowed atheists are sometimes very open to being prayed for. 
when they're in trouble. And so our heroine with no name tells her mistress and her work is done. That's not much, is it? Just one compassionate, faith-filled, bold sentence. A mustard seed of kindness. She did what she could. And in a way, that's all that God ever asks any of us. We do what we can in the power of the Spirit, and we leave the rest to him. And look what God does with it. Look how many people God works through to enable Naaman to get to a place where he can be healed and come to know the living God. Well, there's Naaman's wife, who must believe in the possibility and encourage her husband to go. There is the king of Aram, who must resolve the geopolitical issues to make it possible for Naaman to enter Israel. There's the king of Israel who must accede to Elisha's request. There's Naaman's servants who must help their master overcome his pride and his petty nationalism and enable him to do this very simple thing. There's Elisha's servant who must take the, the, the message to Naaman. There's Elisha himself who must communicate God's message. And there is Naaman who must wash. The servant girl is just one link in a chain that leads to healing and definitive conversion. Just one link. I wonder who else is God involving in ministering to people that you're concerned about or that you've already ministered to? Perhaps people in previous workplaces, perhaps people now that you won't see the result of, but you may find out in 10, 20 years time or maybe next week that the Lord has done something magnificent and glorious in their lives. Who else will God involve in ministering to people? And I wonder how many people did he involve in ministering to you in order to bring you to himself? We just don't know, do we, what God is up to? I think one of the problems when we think of ministry to others is that we often set the bar rather too high for ourselves. It's as if we may believe that we've really only done something significant when we feel like we've laid out the whole gospel before someone. Ministry, as we see in the case of name and servant girl, is love in action. And that's never a bad place to start, is it? It can be indeed little things, a kind PS on the end of an email, a call to a client uh, who's been furloughed, or a colleague, a card to someone going through a hard time, a link to a webinar on how not to murder your teenagers, a delivery meal to a colleague who's living on their own, a little box of brownies for somebody's birthday. Loads of ideas. I'd love to hear what yours are. And of course, I'm not saying that ministry at work or anyone else, anywhere else for that matter, is limited to kindness and compassion. There are all kinds of ways to be fruitful for the Lord through modelling Godly character, through doing good work in the power of the Spirit, through seeking to shape a culture, through standing up for, for justice, making sure that the people who empty our waste paper baskets at five in the morning get, get a living wage, making sure that there is equal pay and genuinely equal op opportunities for women and people who aren't white and Caucasian. And yes, fruitfulness of work does involve yearning for and by God's grace taking the opportunities in the power of his spirit to share the good news, to speak of him with our colleagues. But ministry is never less than blessing people. You may not be able to share the gospel tomorrow on a Zoom call or in a conversation on the phone. You may not be able to do that every day or even every week or even every month. But almost every day we can find a way to bless someone, to bless a colleague, to serve them, to show kindness, to show we care. And if we don't see a big change in them ourselves, the unnamed servant girl reminds us that we are part of a process. One breaks up the ground, one plants, one waters. But as Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 3, 7, so neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Now the unnamed servant girl 
was on her own. But when it comes to ministry, virtual or present, there's no reason why you should be. Involve someone else in praying for your work, your co-workers, your organisation. So then I wonder, is there something you can learn from this clear-headed, compassionate, full of faith, bold, credible little girl, as you consider the people you know at or through your work? Is there something that we can learn from this little girl as we consider that many of the people we connect to every day suffer from a deadly disease that whose effects will not end with death? In the end, as Nahum acknowledges in verse 15, here's what he says. Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. In the end, every human being will one day have to acknowledge that there is no other God than the God of Israel, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, that the Lord, who gave his life that we might live, would work through us to prevent those that we connect to from bowing before Jesus as eternally damned rebels rather than as grateful disciples of their wonderful Saviour. Amen. Well, Mark, thank you for speaking to us. Uh, thank you for joining with us as well. Uh, next week, we'll be continuing this series and we'll be looking at Nehemiah, uh, a man who is in the right place at the right time and seized an opportunity to do something extraordinary under the Lord's hand. Ross Hendry will be preaching for us next week and I hope you'll be able to gather with us uh, as we look at that chapter of the Bible together. Well, wherever you are and whatever the week has in store for you, uh, let me say a final word of prayer as we close our time together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who does not hide away in a corner, but who by your Spirit fills your people and sends them with your authority into the world to live and speak for you. And we pray that we would be encouraged and emboldened in that, in the places you have put us in this week. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.